بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا So today we go over ذكر and remembrance and mindfulness in the text So then we go over, we'll end with a really important tool on how to manage behaviors, compulsive behaviors, and break habits. So, but first, what I want to talk about, keep it really simple, the benefits of dhikr. Once we understand the benefits, if we're not getting the benefits of dhikr, then maybe we need to redefine what is dhikr. And then once we are clear what is dhikr, then how do we weaponize it in order to treat our compulsive habits? How do we use it to help break our compulsive habits? So first, uh, the benefits of dhikr. So in Surah 13, Ayah 28, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala bi qulub. So unquestionably, verily, with the dhikr of Allah, the hearts find peace, tranquility, reassurance. So it's an equation. It's a one plus one equals two equation. With the dhikr of Allah comes peace and tranquility. Dhikr, peace. The second benefit I wanted to highlight is that dhikr also prevents unwanted behavior. It helps you break unwanted behavior. So in Surah 29, Ayah 45, Surah Al-Kabut, so, verily, salah prevents fahsha, so immoral acts, behavior, and uh, al munkar, so evil behavior, behavior we don't want, and the remembrance of Allah, wala dhikrullah akbar, and the remembrance of Allah is greater. Is is greater and salah. We know salah is a type of dhikr. Salah is a dhikr. Um, so we have these benefits, and if we start from the benefits, then it can help us to realize: Are we achieving these benefits? Are we benefiting from these benefits or not? And if not, then we can start looking at: Well, how do we change our dhikr of Allah in order to reap those benefits? So, for example, if I told you. Uh, chocolate had benefits. It was sweet. It tasted good. And let's say you had chocolate and you're like, no, this doesn't, I'm not tasting that. I don't get those benefits. Then you're probably not doing it right. You're probably not eating it right. And then I ask you, well, how are you eating the chocolate? And you say, well, I heard it's really strong. So what I do is you know, I take the M&M and I put it in my mouth to drink some water and just have it go directly down like a pill. But I don't taste any sweetness to it. And then you say, well, yeah, no, that line of reasoning is good. But in order to really appreciate and get the benefits of chocolate, you got to go slow. You got to chew it, so on and so forth. And that's when you'll really taste chocolate. So with the dhikr of Allah that provides peace, then the question is, is, are we doing it right? Are we chewing it right? So we know there's the benefits. There's a sweetness to it. There's a taste to it. That's been established for generations. Um, you know, the deen is not a new thing. So then the question is, is what is dhikr? And what is the dhikr of Allah? Because both ayat, it's the dhikr of Allah that provides the benefit. So let's break down dhikr. Let's break down dhikr of Allah. So... Imam al-Sabuni writes in his famous tafsir on the ayah of dhikr, specifically an ayah, فَذْكُرُونِ أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَشْكُرُولِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ سُوتِ الْبَقْرَةِ He says of dhikr, he said, أَصْلُ الذِّكَرْ أَتَّنَبُّهْ بِالْقَلْبِ لِلْمَذْكُورِ He said the foundation or the essence, the root of dhikr is التنبه. It is a awareness. It's a consciousness. It's a focus. A tanabu is to notice, perceive, realize, become aware. Bil qalb, with the heart, 
to the thing that you're trying to remember. So it's a focus on something. And he goes on to say, وَسُمِيَ الذِّكَرْ بِاللِّسَانِ ذِكْرًا لِأَنَّهُ alama عَلَى الذِّكَرْ الْقَلْبِي So, and dhikr is named dhikr with the tongue. Uh, so dhikr with the tongue is called dhikr also because it's a sign of the dhikr of the heart. And so what the point here is, is the essence is there's a focus to it. So obviously the, the sunnah is we, the Prophet would make all types of dhikr with his tongue. But the importance is, is that focus there? And so there's a focus to it. There's a mindfulness to it. There's awareness to it. So that's number one point I wanted to get across of, of dhikr. There's a mindfulness to it. And then we know it from the hadith as well. So the Prophet وسلم, was reported to have said, this is collected by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim, both in their collections. مَن نَسْيَ فَلْيُصَلِّيهَا إِذَا ذَكَرَهَا so the one who forgets their salah should pray it when they remember it. So here it's not referring to the, the most apparent meaning is it's not a referring to when you say it with your tongue, when you remember it. So basically, I, I know this is common sense essentially, but I wanted to really drive home the point that if we're not appreciating the benefits, there might be a, a lack in our focus. We're just sort of swallowing the chocolate without really chewing on it and allowing ourselves to taste it. So then, and the important part is we, we do dhikr already because it's a focus and a mindfulness. Then the question is, is what are we mindful of? Because the, what we're mindful of will, will affect our state. So if you focus on certain things, it will change your state. So for example, you have speech. You know, one of the biggest fears is public speaking. So you, you have a speech, you have to give a speech. It's in front of your colleagues or in school or whatever. And then you have to prepare the speech and get ready for it. So now if before the speech, you're focusing on all the bad outcomes. What if my voice cracks? What if I forget what I have to say? What if everybody laughs at me? So on and so forth. If you're constantly focusing on the bad outcomes, that's going to create a state within you. And that's going to essentially lead to a bad outcome behaviorally. Similar, similarly, if you do the, out, uh, the opposite, if you focus on the good outcomes and you visualize good outcomes, and then that also changes the way you feel and also changes your outcomes, study show. So we do dhikr. We know that what we focus on changes how we think, feel, and then also how we behave. So now, okay. So then how do we get the benefits? So either it's because it, it's the dhikr of Allah, which leads to this breaking the behavior and leads to this peace and tranquility. So we talked about dhikr, but then there's another step of it which is the dhikr of allah where the peace and tranquility comes from so let's say you're you're chewing it right the chocolate and you you're tasting it but you say something like you know i know chocolate i've eaten it it's sour and lemony and maybe it's muddy you say well hmm okay you're you're eating the chocolate right but are you really eating chocolate is that what you're eating so you might be chewing it right, but is, are you getting what you're supposed to be getting? So in other words, the number one point is to make the dhikr with focus. But then the second point is the dhikr of Allah. So is our understanding of Allah correct? So it's important to recognize and grow constantly with our understanding of Allah and understand Allah on Allah's terms. So through the recitation of the Quran through the agreed upon understandings and so on and so forth. So when we say mindfulness, mindfulness is, is of the present moment. You're simply attaching the present moment to Allah. When you, when you're mindful, 
And when you're making dhikr of Allah, you're attaching that present moment to Allah. In other words, Allah had knowledge of the moment before it occurred. He willed that moment to occur. He's watching and aware of the moment. And there's always a hikmah associated to his creation, to the moment that he's created. There's always a hikmah to it. And so when we're mindful of the present moment, when we use these tools to become mindful of the present moment, we're becoming mindful of Allah in that present moment. Okay, so then we talk about in the text, how do we use mindfulness? Because, you know, we're commanded to make dhikr. And we're, com we're told to make dhikr. We're told to make dhikr abundantly in, in the deen. And so there's the aspect of it where we do it. And then there's the aspect of it where we recognize that there's benefits to it. Now, what the book goes into, and we'll just go over one quick um, exercise. It's a really important exercise. What the book goes into is taking this mindfulness and purposing it, repurposing it for a specific situation. And that's how do you attach a craving when it comes? So, you know, you can read this chapter on its own. We're going to cherry pick parts of this chapter because we, we really can't go through all the chapters um, in depth and in detail. So we're going to talk about some important features of it and the exercises of it. So I would absolutely encourage everybody to just read it like they're reading the other parts of the book. And we can always ask questions about it at the end, so on and so forth. But this exercise is an important exercise. It's exercise 7.4. It's called sober breathing. Page 144. Sober breathing. Sober is an acronym. S-O-B-E-R. And it says, when you develop some understanding and experience of mindfulness, because again, mindfulness is what it's called in the scientific literature, and then you're able to understand what is mindfulness and what are the benefits of mindfulness. So we're not taking some philosophical concept that exists today and that's in vogue today and superimposing that on our tradition. We don't do that. We take traditional interpretations of our tradition, classical interpretations of our tradition from the scholars, and we understand that. And if it so happens that it's now being studied or aspects of it are being studied, great, let's benefit from that as well. So this aspect of mindfulness, just being able to be present of the moment has been studied significantly in the literature. We talked about that. And it's been shown to have a lot of benefits like lowering blood pressure, improving mood. And one of the other things they study is that is studied is its effect on cravings. So cravings to engage in your compulsive habit and your addictive behavior, whatever that is. And really you just have to try it. You really just have to experience it. All of this is on the basis of trust. And then you kind of read studies or read from a, like the book experts in the field. And then, okay, maybe it's plausible that this works. But then when you actually try it and taste it, then you can really get an understanding of how powerful these things are. So now that you have some experience with what mindfulness is, the te technique in exercise 7.4, which is a technique for connecting with the present moment, will be easy to learn. It takes just a minute or two to practice, making it an ideal go-to skill when you're in a tempting, stressful, or otherwise upsetting situation. You can use the acronym SOBER to help you remember the steps. So first step, the S in SOBER. The first step is stop. When you find yourself in a tempting situation, the first thing you need to do to connect with the present moment become mindfulness, become mindful, is to stop and step out of automatic pilot modes. So everything we've been talking about addiction, how addiction works subconsciously from the perspective of neuroscience, so on and so forth, to step out of the automatic pilot mode and decouple your craving from an automatic behavior. So you stop, you step outside of it, 
you, when you stop, you interrupt that automatic sequence of behaviors that can follow a craving or a strong emotion. And it's that very sequence that you are working on changing when you are in addiction recovery. So stop, number one. Number two, observe. The O is observe. Once you've stopped and stepped out of automatic pilot, the next step is to observe your experience. What's going on? Observe what is happening right in that moment. Ask yourself, what are you feeling right now? Using the example of a craving, observing what you feel in your body and thoughts you have about drinking or using and any emotions you might be experiencing. Thoughts you have about drinking, using, or, or whatever your addictive behavior is. No, drinking and, and using is oftentimes now really just a agreed upon addictive behavior. It's the most manifest addictive behavior. In reality, there's many addictive behaviors um, outside of drinking and using. So whatever your addictive behavior, notice yourself allowing the presence of these uncomfortable aspects of your experience, letting them be just as they are rather than pushing them away. Number three, Breathe. You've taken yourself out of automatic pilot and observed your present experience. The next step is to connect it with your breath. Take a moment to do this, guiding your attention to the movement of your breath. The fourth is expand your awareness. So the E is for expand your awareness, broadening your focus from the movement of your breath, because the breath is like a tool that's easy to focus on and, and constantly going. You can now expand your awareness to include your entire body as a whole, connecting with all the sensations you're experiencing in the present moment. And then five is respond mindfully. So now you stopped, you have put some distance between the trigger, the feeling, and the act, and now you respond mindfully. We've been talking about responding with mindful awareness rather than reacting in automatic pilot. This is the final step in the sober breathing ex exercise. Now that you have connected with your experience and your breath, you can consider the range of choices that you have in this situation. Recognize that you can accept the discomfort that you're feeling. And while you are allowing it to be there just as it is, you can still respond by choosing with mindful awareness of Allah, of the situation, of what's going on, what action to take. You're in a better place to consider the consequences of the different choices you can make and choose to respond to the discomfort you're experiencing in a way that is nurturing, self-protective, and consistent with recovery goals. So S-O-B-E-R stands for sober. So I would encourage reading it, uh, practicing it, and then having it be ready as a tool when the next craving come, comes, when the next craving comes. And if you have some practice of dhikr, then just purpose it for this. Purpose it for this. Double down on it. Because inna salata tanha and al fahsha wal munkar wala dhikrullah akbar. Because dhikr, salah, and dhikr prevent unwanted behaviors. But you get we have to do it right with focus and and um, with the important prerequisites. And this is a tool amongst all the tools that we've been talking about. So this is like a fight. That's exactly what this is. And I know I say this a lot, but that's important to remember, to coach yourself through this. Like you can't just go into a fight with a jab because the enemy is gonna figure that out and counteract that. So if you, all you do is jab and you only have one thing, it's not gonna work. You wanna jab, you wanna cross, you wanna hook, and you wanna do whatever you need to do combination of that in order to overcome your enemy sometimes you'll lose sometimes you'll win 
but every time you get put down, you want to pr keep practicing it. It's just, an, it's just a sign that you haven't mastered the skills yet. So you want to keep practicing it, keep practicing it and keep going. So we have the, you know, mindfulness exercises, strengthening your dhikr. If you have a practice of dhikr, having good company, um, attending gatherings that are strengthening you, you mentally, you have um, a pros and cons list that we've talked about, and then writing that pros and cons list on something meaningful to you. Maybe it's a, a goal that you have, or let's say it's a picture of a, of a child or something that somebody you're doing it for, or just on an index card and you put it in your wallet and you pull it out every or your cell phone. And then you pull it out every time you have a craving, you can look at that pros and cons list. Why am I doing this again? What are the cons? Because this is one of the tools that have been um, suggested and tested for decades. It's called a, um, a pros and cons list. It's called, called a decisional balance, decades of research on it. And then um, you do, and then all the other tools that we've talked about. So you do all of those and you try to break the craving, whatever is available to you. And then you work through it one step at a time. And, and you get there. And then once you come out the other end, you come out stronger, you come out more connected to Allah, you come out a better person. And then you recognize that this is a test that brought you to, that will bring you inshallah to things that are, that you wouldn't have been able to get to had you not had that training ground. So inshallah, let's start with questions. We can talk about questions that are from this chapter or previous chapters. And then um, we'll open it up for check-ins, inshallah. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. So mindfulness is really, you know, if you look at it, it's not, it can be many things. Mindfulness can bring a lot of peace. It can lower blood pressure. It has a lot of different benefits. Um, and there's an important reason to that, just because of the way our culture has become, we're constantly bombarded with digital stimuli. And that has a whole host of downstream side effects. So if we're able to kind of um, ground ourselves and just take a break from that internally, uh, then we have a whole downstream effect, uh, host of benefits from it. What I'm trying to do, inshallah, in today's talk is really highlight the overlap of dhikr and mindfulness. Mindfulness is being aware of the present moment. Dhikr is simply being aware of the present moment and Allah's presence in that moment. Dhikr is being present of Allah's presence. Um, so dhikr is being aware of Allah. And we, we don't know the, the essence of Allah. We can't grasp the essence of Allah. We can't grasp the sifat of Allah, his characteristics. They're like Abdul Ghani al Ghunaymi al Maidani, an, a, an important scholar in Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and he writes a, a commentary on uh, Al Aqidah al Tahawiyah. He says, The sifat, the characteristics, la tudrak wa la tutrak. You can't leave them and you can't fully grasp them either. And so there's the sifat, and then there's his af'al, his actions. And his actions is this creation around us like the makhluk and being present of his actions and then being present of the fact that everything around us is a creation of Allah. And that's how we interact with Allah. And that's how we become present with Allah. That's how we remember Allah. And so that's the bottom line of it. And when we do that, it has a whole host of benefits to it. And that's inshallah what we're going to talk about today. So I'll go into the, like the formal talk but I just wanted to sort of bottom line it. Like, why is this important to us? Why are we talking about it in addiction treatment? And it has an incredible importance. It has an incredible importance because not only does it have these benefits, it's not something that we have to do religiously and dogmatically, but it also has incredible benefits to us. And that's what I really want to get across. And then we can sort of go into the text, which then basically functionalizes mindfulness. Like, how do you use it in the moment? It weaponizes it, you know? It weaponizes it, and it tells us how do you use mindfulness, basically, um, in terms of treating your addiction. 